Hello everyone and welcome back to Animation Pilgrimage, the show where Tanil and I take a look at every single theatrically released animated film in chronological order. I'm Sean. I'm Tanil. And today we are taking a look at The Lord of the Rings from Ralph Bakshi here in the US of A. Ralph Bakshi made an adaptation of Lord of the Rings. Who would have seen that coming? As far as I know, this is the only animated adaptation of The Lord of the Rings. Well, only adaptation is in there's also The Hobbit. And yeah, then... but this is The Lord of the Rings, not The Hobbit. Yeah, but then there's also... Okay, so there's actually... There's The Hobbit, which mm -hmm. Rankin Bass made. Yes. There's this... And then Rankin Bass made Return of the King. Wait, Rankin Bass made the sequel? And it's just a TV special. I thought Ralph Bakshi made it. No. And we'll get into that when we start talking about the production of this. But holy cow. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the animated saga of The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings is kind of a mess. Um... But anyway, I guess in case you don't know what the Lord of the Rings is, Sean, do you want to fill people in? Uh, sure. <laughs> this is incredibly abbreviated. <laughs> so, there's an evil ring that can control everything or something like that, and a hobbit, aka a very small person, has acquired it through means. And he is accompanied by a whole bunch of other people. They become the Fellowship of the Ring which is the name of the first book. Mm -hmm. And it includes four hobbits, a dwarf, an elf, two humans, and a wizard, which doesn't count as a human or anything else. There's, he is a wizard. He is a wizard. Wizards are their own species, I guess. And, I guess and Maybe when you, when you become a wizard, you cast aside... Your humanity or whatever. Yeah. Which is apparent in how the universe works, if you know anything about the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Anyways... Mm -hmm. They travel across all of Middle Earth, which is the, the land that they live in, and they go through caves and mountains and treacherous things. And Because they need to take the ring to Mordor, which was the place it was made, and they need to throw it in the volcano. And destroy it. And along the way, the weak heart of men is tested, and Boromir, one of the humans, wants to take the ring and use it for evil purposes because that's what the ring does. It corrupts people and makes them want to go evil. Which is why a hobbit must carry it. Because especially... he's a pure soul and not yeah. human. Yeah. Also, don't give it to an elf or a wizard or a dwarf because they are also easily corruptible. And wizards are very incredibly powerful and you don't want to give them... A ring a that ring. is also super powered. Mm -hmm. Like... They make it through everything. The wizard dies at one point fighting a demon from hell or something. <laughs> I like how you're pretending that you don't know the story of Lord of the Rings. Well, if someone doesn't know the story, that's what they'd get out of this. Uh-huh. They make it not even all the way in this movie. They adventure for quite a while. The Fellowship is split apart, rent asunder, because... Bad things happen. They're attacked by goblins and orcs and stuff. Everybody gets split up. Frodo, Frodo and Sam, two of our hobbits, uh, are together and they keep trying to get to Mordor. The two other hobbits, Merry and Pippin, get captured by orcs, which are part of the baddies. Mm -hmm. So the remaining elf, dwarf, and human Aragorn work together to try to save the two hobbits that they know are taken. This is after Boromir is dead and our wizard Gandalf has already died a while ago. Mm -hmm. And that's the end of the Fellowship of the Rings and the halfway point of this movie. Yeah. This movie was like two hours long. Mm hmm. Er, no, it was two hours and 15 minutes long. Very long for an animated film. Uh huh. And it covers the first two books of The Lord of the Rings. Two and a half. Or, or, or sorry, one and a half. It only goes halfway through The Two Towers. Doesn't it? No. No? No, it goes all the way through the two towers. Okay. It is the first the two first books. The first two books? Okay. So in the second half of the story, it's very split up. Uh, Frodo and Sam uh, get joined by Smeagol or Gollum, who is the previous owner of the ring, 
or like one who's of the, been driven mad by he's it. He's driven mad and is absolutely crazy, but they're using him to lead them to Mordor secretly through back ways and stuff. And in the meantime, the rest of the party is running around gr the great fields of Rohan, the land of the horse people, and they save a king from being mind corrupted by a bad advisor. A bad advisor, and then they take everybody to Helm's Deep, which is this big human cathedral well, ca castle. Not, yeah, a castle stronghold. There That's you the go. A human, <laughs> a human stronghold in the mountains where they're going to defend themselves against the armies of Saruman, an evil wizard that's working for the bang bad guy, Sauron. I hate those names. Yes, I, I hate, hate how similar they are. Saruman and Sauron. Yeah, it's bad. Mm -hmm. They defend themselves and I guess I forgot this point, but partway through them wandering around the fields of Rohan, they meet back up with wizard Gandalf. He came back to life and now is no longer Gandalf the Grey. He's Gandalf the White. He leveled up or evolved or something. Yeah. He's a stronger wizard now. And he also kind of doesn't remember his old life or it's like, a, that was me, but now I'm a new person type of thing. Yeah. It, it's, it's almost like a reincarnation thing for a wizard, I guess, when you evolve. Level up the color spectrum. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's, I, I don't get it's it. It's an interesting thing. The humans are able to defeat the warring evil bad guys with the help of so many Helms humans. Helms Deep and the tree people and... That's the thing. The ants don't do anything in this movie. Yeah, I guess they don't. There's a tree person called uh, Treebeard the Ent, who actually is the one that ends up saving Merry and Pippin, the two hobbits that were captured. Yeah. There was a whole mess. They got lost. And after the Battle of Helm's Deep, the movie's like, and that was some great adventures from the Lord of the Rings. Tune in next time for more. Bye. Bye. Like, it just kind of ends. Yeah. The good guys win. Bye. <laughs> so the, the ending of the movie is very unsatisfactory because uh, Sam and Frodo are still wandering around. Mm -hmm. Everybody else just kind of won a battle and they're not anywhere significant. They're like, hey, we saved these humans from the bad guys, but we didn't defeat the bad guys overall. We're just kind of here. Yeah. Because this is the sec the end of the second book compared to the climax of the third book or anything. Right. Like, this is two ways through the trilogy. It's not going to be a satisfying ending. And I honestly don't know how much of any of that makes sense to someone that hasn't already Experience. been... Experienced? Been acclimated to the Lord of the Rings. Right. Nowadays, there's the very, very, very well-known live-action trilogy movies of the Lord of the Rings by Steven Spielberg? Uh, no. By... <laughs> I knew as soon as I said it, like, that's... <laughs> by Peter movie. Jackson. Peter Jackson, of course. That's his name. Done by Peter Jackson. So most people have probably seen the Lord of the Rings, or at the very least, they are very well... Have absorbed it through cultural osmosis. Yes, you know what it is. But not everybody, yeah. especially a lot of the younger generation. They probably don't know it as well. They might know the especially... Hobbit trilogy, which is a trash fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like it's been a few years. So there's probably quite a few people who haven't, you know, grown up watching uh, those films um, at this point now. But yeah, that's my biggest question coming away from this is I wonder how much of this I would actually understand if. Lord of the Rings wasn't something I'm very familiar with through cultural osmosis and experiencing the movies. I've never read the books. Um, it's on my eventual to-do list. You know, same. Uh, my mom used to read the books to us when we were in the car, like on long car rides. But you don't really remember any of it? I don't really it. remember because I probably fell asleep most of the time because that's when she was reading the book. She was reading like on the way home from Grandma's house, which was an hour and a half away from our house. Right. It's like, I don't remember anything. Mm -hmm. I was asleep. Anyway. But, like, I definitely watched the first movie to the point where I could pretty much quote it by heart. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The movies are good. The, the live-action movies are good. We're talking about this movie, though. And I think it's good. I, I think. think. It's definitely or... my favorite Bakshi film now. Yes, absolutely. Up to this point. And I'm going to have to talk about why I think it's good and why I'm questioning it. Right. 
because I don't necessarily think this is the best adaptation of The Lord of the Rings because... Obviously, a better one exists. A better one does exist. But I think this movie... Stands on its own enough? Is the perfect... It it is like the quintessential late 70s nerd culture Mm -hmm. in one piece Mm -hmm. that I... I don't know what to tell you other than if you want to know what early nerds were like in the 70s, (laughs) this is it. Right. Because... This is a nerd movie. This isn't a cool Peter Jackson live action movie. This is a nerd movie. This movie heavily relies on rotoscope to a stupid degree, as in literally everything in the movie is rotoscoped. And if you're not a main character, you don't even get rotoscoped. You just get a filter put over you. Okay, see. And that now, looks bad. <laughs> yes. I, I really want to talk about this for, for a hot minute. Yes. So the rotoscoping done in this film has been criticized to Helen back. Um, and most of it's justified. Ralph Bakshi is already a little too dependent on it in his last film, Wizards. Um, and then it's you know, super prevalent here, but I understand why he did it. One, it's cost effective. Two, it feels appropriate for something like Lord of the Rings. It just has that the costuming has to be reliant upon what you can costume in real life. And therefore it's really cheap. It's incredibly cheesy. And that's why it feels so 70s. Well, yeah, it feels like LARPing. Yeah, it feels like this is a movie of LARPers that someone drew over. It (laughs) feels great. Yeah, it's kind of cool, actually. And I think stylistically, art direction-wise, this movie feels like the natural progression from what we saw. And we haven't had a chance to talk about this movie Mm -hmm. a lot, but... You know, Rankin Bass did The Hobbit, and this does feel like a sequel to that in the same way that The Hobbit is a prequel to Lord of the Rings. Like, it is stylistically different, the tone is different, but But you can see how it shifts over to this. Yeah, and like, they were in... (laughs) These two productions were not, you know, working together. It just, that's a happenstance. Mm -hmm. So I find that interesting. And then I want to defend the rotoscoping on the main characters. I think it's actually really well done. Yeah. The main characters are charming. The rotoscope fits the tone of the piece. And the animation could be slightly better, but I think it works very well for this project. Yeah, because they're going for high fantasy cheese. Oh, yeah. Which is exactly what they want in, like, the 70s. If you're doing a high fantasy piece like this, it feels like someone's D&D campaign. Right. Now, the quote-unquote animation filter they put over the crowds... Crowd shots? That doesn't look good. And that looks really like... sad. That looks like garbage. It's very uncanny and unsettling to look at. And, and especially... Definitely ages this film more than anything else. Especially when you have rotoscope people in the same shot. Yeah. It's like the battle sequences at the end. It's like Aragorn's running around with a sword and he's fully animated on top of a rotoscope person. But then the people he's fighting are just the filter and it doesn't look good. Yeah, it's... Like I said, really uncanny. Um, but when it is just the main characters on screen, like, I, I think this film looks good. The background art is wonderful. Like, I like the art direction of it besides their use of this animation filter to quote-unquote rotoscope mm-hmm. um, for, the, for the crowd shots. It just does not look good. But again, I understand why they did it. It... Lord of the Rings is a huge story with a huge cast to try and accomplish. And, like, this was just kind of way out of league for an animation studio to do in the 70s. Yeah, absolutely. I will say, because we have rotoscoped everyone, Mm -hmm. they had to get actual actors for everyone. Yeah. And that means that they have, they had at minimum... Mm -hmm. four people to uh, take the roles of the hobbits. 
So the four people I got to play these roles definitely had dwarfism. I'm assuming. Right. Because we they can had assume that, but I'm not, I'm not sure. Because they had four people and the characters are rotoscoped. They're I, rotoscoped people yeah. that are size accurate to everyone else on screen. So when it's like Frodo interacting with Gandalf, you have somebody that is tall in wizard garb and then you have a much significantly shorter person with uh, smaller proportions that I can only assume was someone with dwarfism. I don't know if they were ever credited in the movie because mm -hmm. they were definitely not the actors, the voice actors right. for the Hobbits. And that sucks that that's just like, they I mean, might have been written off is, somewhere This in is there. too much of an assumption for me to, to say yes one way or another mm -hmm. on. I, I don't know. I think that's a fair assumption, but I don't have anything to back that up. Okay. And maybe someone here in the comments knows more about this and, and can say something, but it's cool if that's true. Also not cool that they weren't credited, but like, you know, I, I can't say one way or another on that yeah. topic. Just looking at the video footage, it makes me think that they were. Right. But we don't know that. Well, I, I don't know that for sure. I, I might have to scour the credits again to see if it says anything about that in there. Yeah. But... If they did, cool. If you didn't credit them, why didn't you do that? But, like, size accuracy? I don't know. They could have very easily filmed the reference footage in the same way that you film reference. Or, or you would shoot a film like this, though, with illusions. And, like, I know that they have correct proportions to, mm -hmm. like, being hobbits, but... That could just be an animator, you know, using the character model sheet. I don't know. But there's like specific shots where they're running as a crowd. Uh -huh. And like it's the, they don't even, it's just filter. They don't rotoscope the people. Mm -hmm. And like they're in the shot and it's like, there we go. I think they did it. I don't know. Don't know on that one. Um. Anyway, going back to the film though, there's so much cut. Like, story-wise, I really don't know. This is combining two books, and it's really unfortunate. Understandable why, because Bakshi did want to make this into two movies. And unfortunately, this movie, he wanted to be named The Lord of the Rings Part 1. But his distributors would argue with him consistently about this and just told him to keep it to be the Lord of the Rings because in their eyes, they said people won't want to pay for half a movie. And Bakshi says, well, no, if you don't tell people that it's part one, they're going to be mad when they get to the end of the movie and it's not the full story. Mm -hmm. It's going to leave off on a very unsatisfying note. But it got released as The Lord of the Rings. People went to go see it and then were mad when it was not all three books in one movie. <laughs> and then there, are, of course, was also mixed reviews about rotoscoping and, like, stuff that was cut. So, like, this film did pretty well financially, but it also, like, was very a very mixed bag critically, which has just been kind of a pattern we've seen with Bakshi's movies um, up to this point. Yeah. Like, I definitely think it's one of his better movies, but that might just be because I really like The Lord of the Rings and I know what the hell is going on. Yeah. And Bakshi was actually very passionate about adapting Lord of the Rings and very passionate about keeping it to the source material. And it tells. You don't... There's not... Like... Gandalf no is a weird... walking around with fucking cigars in his mouth or any shit like that. Yeah. <laughs> That's they're, a perfect comparison. They're not like cursing everywhere, every other word or anything. It, yeah. It's like, no, it's the book. In fact, like there's many times in this movie where they directly quote the book. Mm -hmm. And I know they're directly quoting the book because it's the exact same lines as are, that are in the live action remake that gets ha that happens way down the line. Yeah, well, and this film was an inspiration for the live action film as well, which oh, is I unsurprising. It. I believe it, yeah. Why would you not? Even if 
yeah, it's like, why, why, why would you not, you know, use this as a source of inspiration? He had at first been given a treatment of the script that was um, written by someone who wrote all three books into one movie, had cut lots of characters, added others, had like, a pair, according to Bakshi, had some kind of like advertisement for shoes in the middle of it. What? Look, Bakshi tends to exaggerate things, so I'm just saying what he said. <laughs> okay. I don't know. As far as I know, this treatment of the script has been lost to time, so Bakshi could say anything he wanted here. <laughs> um, but he said that, like, this guy didn't get it, which, you know, if this, if it's, if he's to be believed, then yes, I would say that it was probably a poor adaptation of Lord of the Rings, although it might have made a better film. I don't know. Uh, Bakshi was not happy with that, ended up taking up, um, writing a new script, making it much more uh, closely adapted from the book, and even went to Tolkien's daughter to get her, like, blessing for it, and, you know, told her he was very passionate about, like, making sure that what Tolkien put on page came to life in the film. And, you know, that was his main goal, which I think is cool, um, especially from someone like Bakshi, who, you know, I, I don't... I don't have a lot of things I agree on with, with him, him on. on. So, like, I like seeing this side of him. I like seeing uh, something that I can relate to him with. Yes. He was passionate about all of this, but unfortunately, the production of this whole thing was kind of the straw that broke Bakshi's back. Um, he was... Very disappointed in how it did critically. He then never got the funding to do the second part that he wanted to do. Rankin Bass, in the midst of production on Lord of the Rings, started working on Return of the King. And he tried to stop them, but like he didn't, he, there was nothing he could do about it. And he was mad about the whole part one thing not being added. And now, like, it just turned into a huge confusing mess. And, like, I don't blame him for being frustrated about all that at all. Also, nowadays, you can buy The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, and uh, Return of the King all as a DVD set. Even as if they were all connected to each other. And they're not. And they're supposed not. Supposed to be, but I guess they are. Yeah. And then just going over some reviews that were out when this uh, film came out. Uh, critics were generally mixed in their responses to the film, but generally considered it to be a flawed but inspired interpretation. The consensus on Rotten Tomatoes is a 52%, with the consensus of Ralph Bakshi's valiant attempt at rendering Tolkien's magnum opus in Rotoscope never lives up to the grandeur of its source material, with a compromised running time that flattens a sweeping story and experimental animation that is more bizarre than magical. I think that's fair. Frank Barrow of The Hollywood Reporter wrote that the film was daring and unusual in concept. And Roger Ebert called Bakshi's effort a mixed blessing and an entirely respectable, occasionally impressive job, which still falls far short from the charm and sweep of the original story. I, I think all of that is completely fair. Yep. I don't know that I would be as critical to it because to me this is just more of like a fun interesting film to try and watch that's different from the live action films if we didn't yeah. have the live action films i could see being a little bit more harsh on this one yeah it's the kind of thing where i'd honestly suggest checking it out mm -hmm. like get a group of friends together that like you like playing D, &D with or you have enjoyed Lord of the Rings, and go into it knowing that it's not going to be perfect. That it was made in the 70s, and it feels 70s. Just a cheesy 70s adventure fantasy, fantasy film. film. Yeah. yeah. And I guess it should also be said that it, it is kind of... Like, Lord of the Rings feels like an odd turn for Bakshi, but when you hear about his own passion for the story, and then you think about his work on Wizards... Mm-hmm. Um, 
it becomes clear, like, like he wanted to do this. And more backstory on that is he's actually been wanting to make a Lord of the Rings adaptation since, like, the late 50s is when he first read the books. And then, you know, he was constantly trying to push for, um, you know, getting the rights to do it. And he thought it would be perfect for animation. He apparently also thought Disney had the rights to it. At some point, I don't know where that came from. That mm. could just be another one of Bakshi's exaggerated stories, but I don't know. I, I would need to look into that. Then he also had several people and actors come up to him and ask to be a part of this project. Oh. So there, that, like, there was a lot of interest going into this film, and he was very passionate about it, which is cool. Yeah. Oh, and another fun fact is... John Hurt was a part of this project, and so that makes two films this year we've seen that have John Hurt in it. He was Bigwig in Watership Down, and then he was Boromir in this. Oh. Now, the real question, was he the live-action actor for Boromir as well? Yeah, I don't know. I gotta say, costuming-wise, mm -hmm. Boromir is hilarious. <laughs> He's like a Viking. He looks like a Viking barbarian character. Uh -huh. He doesn't look like he's a warrior knight from like one of the last bastions of humanity. He looks like he just crawled out of the woods. <laughs> Again, or, or this is a boat. very different interpretation. I, I mean, it's the stylistic choices of fantasy in the 70s. Mm -hmm. Like... Aragorn does not wear pants. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. And I guess that's another thing I want to talk about really quick is the fact Ralph Bakshi is very passionate about making this in animated film. He's like, I don't see this in any other format. And he even is quoted on saying uh, that to make Lord of the Rings in live action would look hokey, like would just be really cheesy, mm -hmm. which is funny nowadays. But... The only, like, he's right. If they tried to make Lord of the Rings in the 70s in live action. It would look It would hilarious. be so corny and bad. <laughs> and the reason that they could have, that Peter Jackson was able to make Lord of the Rings is because of advancements in technology and the merging of film and animation and like special effects departments like coming together to make a quote unquote live action film be able to do things that previously only animated films were able to do. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Honestly, it just makes me want to rewatch the live action films because it's been a while, a good chunk of years that since I've actually sat down and watched them. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if I can commit to like 12 hours. It's it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> because you can only watch the special extended edition version oh, of the movie. Oh my god. And add like an extra three hours to the entire runtime. <sighs> uh. Anyway. <laughs> Anyways, instead of doing that, join us back here next time as we finish off 1978 with The Mystery of Mamo, which is a Lupin the Third movie. I'm so excited. <laughs> Let's see what that has for us. Oh, yeah.